All right, thank you everybody for coming to our second IO and storage session. Uh, for this session, we have two remote presenters. The first one is going to be looking at some uh, file system configuration piece. And the second one is going to be a bit of a different talk looking at uh, an open source um, program office and how that relates. And we'll, we'll get to that when we get there. But first up, we have uh, Franciele Bioto. Uh, and uh, she's going to tell us about the experimentation she and her team has done looking at BGFS's configuration and how to get the best performance out of it. Hello, good afternoon. So can you can you see the slides? Can you hear me? Is everything okay? Yes. Perfect. Great, so I'll start. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for, for listening to me today. I'm happy to talk about this with you. Uh, my name is Franciele Boito. I'm an associate professor at the University of Bordeaux in France. Uh, and this work has been done in, in collaboration with my colleagues at the INHEA Bordeaux. So we worked about uh, on the on some parameters of BGFS, which I will explain in a bit. But before that, I, I must give you some background. So uh, we, as uh, as we know, so HPC machines, so the the clusters, the supercomputers, uh, for uh, to to allow for access to persistent data, they use a parallel file system. A parallel file system is always deployed over a set of dedicated servers. So there are some nodes in that system that only run the parallel file system, uh, and these servers uh, are shared by all the applications that run all the jobs that run on that on that machine. Uh, in the for the rest of this presentation, I must give you some terminology. So uh, one server, one OSS, or when I say a machine, I'm talking about one of these machines that are dedicated for the parallel file system. Uh, when when each of these machines is usually connected to multiple uh, components of the parallel file system, which are called the storage targets. Well, we have situations where one machine has one storage target, and we have situations where we may have multiple storage targets per machine, uh, as is the case of the cluster that where uh, we conducted this experience. When I talk to you about stripe count, I'm talking about the number of targets. So when we write a file to, the, to a parallel file system, this file is, is uh, split, is, is, uh, we break it into fixed size portions, we call stripes, and we put these portions on different storage targets. We start usually at a random target and we go in round robin and we use a certain number of targets. So that number of targets we we'll use for us to store the same file is called the stripe count. And this is the parameter we are interested in studying. We were interested in studying in this, uh, in this we are interested in study. And uh, I will talk to you a lot about this, about stripe count. So the number of targets, we may have more targets in the system as our stripe count, but our stripe count is how many we use to store each file. So our goal was to say, what is the impact of stripe count uh, on the number of, uh, on the performance of BGFS? And why were we interested in that? Well, because BGFS, it's a relatively recent uh, parallel file system, which has been increasing in popularity. Uh, so, and this is also the system, the, the, the parallel file system we have in our local machine. And we didn't find, we wanted to answer that, but we didn't find uh, answers in the literature for this parallel file system. Uh, and more importantly, we found the, the only answer we found in the literature was a paper that that had tried to answer that and concluded that the number of storage targets had very little impact on the performance. And their recommendation was you should use four storage targets. And then, well, four storage targets, why four? So we were wondering uh, if we have a machine of a different size, should we go to three, should we go to five, uh, why not six? Uh, why, why four? So could, can we generalize this recommendation to any machine? That was that was one of our our goals. And also, of course, what is the number for our machine, which is what we were trying to optimize as well. Also, we were wondering, can we uh, uh, think? Of, can we imagine that we uh, propose a technique where we change this? count and we allocate different targets to different applications so they don't share 
the same targets. And in doing that, we somehow uh, limit the performance they have. So we give more targets to one application that has higher priority, and then that application will have uh, a higher, will reach a higher performance for from the parallel file system. So this is this is kind of this is our ulterior motive for this study. This is what we were trying to answer, and. Uh, uh, to give you a spoiler, we concluded that it was not a good a good idea that we were not going to proceed with that. But today, what I will talk to you about is not this. Is uh, this this study on on this, the impact of the stripe count, and uh, also very importantly, all the lessons that we learned while conducting this study, and uh, all the some other important things that we should keep in mind when uh, when trying to analyze the parallel file system performance. So. For the rest of my talk, I will present you some results uh, that we had, some experiences that we conducted and the results we had. And I will start by talking to you about the, the methodology, how we conducted this. So I will I will try not to bore you with too many details in this talk. You can, uh, if you, uh, this talk is based on a paper that we published this year. And this paper is available online. So if you are interested in all the details, uh, please check the, the, the paper. We have, uh, I added the link at the end of these slides and I can also share in the chat uh, later the, the link for, for the paper. And the paper uh, in the paper, we'll find the link of the Git repository where all the code, all the scripts, everything is there. So if you want to replicate this study and maybe conduct a similar study in our platform, you can, uh, also do that. So what do uh, what is our platform here? We have a machine that we call Pluffin. It's a, uh, you could call it a medium-sized cluster or a small-sized cluster. Uh, you, that depends on what is the size of the, the machine you have in the place where you work. Uh, we would, we argue actually that we, I argue that this uh, is a very typical machine. Of course, we have supercomputers that are huge in scale that have tens of thousands of nodes, but maybe the most most of the machines in the world are are small to medium sized, right? So if we have uh, we uh, our conclusions are mostly for this size of machine, and uh, we think we and I'll show you that we it. It actually has we actually have a big impact. We can have a big impact on performance by selecting well the, the parameters. So we had this we have this machine and for some uh, for some reason, some things that happened, we had the opportunity of running our experiments on the on this machine on, on two different uh, periods in time where we have different networks to access the parallel file system. So we what we have with that is two versions of the same machine, where everything is the same, is the same parallel file system, same nodes, same versions of software. The only thing that changes is the network. Uh, we either have a 10 gigabits per second or 100 gigabits per second links between the compute nodes and the parallel file system. Uh, our our uh, parallel file system in this machine has only two storage servers, so, so two machines that run the parallel file system. And each one has four OSTs, four storage targets. So we have eight in total. Uh, we, we generated benchmarks using IOR uh, for our experiments. IOR is a benchmarking tool for IO. And we, we selected the parameters for this uh, benchmark, trying to, to be sure that we would reach peak performance of the system. And we would be able to only care, only see the impact of the number of search targets. So we uh, we used a single shared file because then we are sure we are, we are using a certain number of, of targets. Uh, we did contiguous accesses. We did requests that were large enough. So we would not have a performance that's affected by uh, latency, by metadata access, by uh, having uh, requests that are too small. Uh, so we we really try to optimize our access patterns so we would only see the impact of uh, this, start, this stripe count, which is what we were trying to study. Uh, and we did, uh, because it's our, our machine, we have a very uh, 
uh, we have we have a uh, good access to it. We have we had uh, some time to run this as well. So we we were lucky that we were able to run each test a uh, hundred times, and we of course try to make it. We we generated the list of tests. We make it random. We put some time between tests to avoid caching effects, warm up effects. To try to uh, to minimize. Uh, the probability of having some external interference uh, affecting our results and all that. And again, if you want the details, I, I can I can give you the, I can explain to you later what uh, why we did that and why. So the first thing that we wanted to I told you that we try to optimize the access pattern. We try to really make an application that would be uh, perfect that would reach peak performance. So we could change the, the number of targets, the, the stripe count and see what would the what the impact would be. Uh, so one of the things was uh, this perfect application, how many nodes does it use? How many compute nodes does it use to access the parallel file system? So when we, uh, we have two uh, networks, right? We have two versions with different network speeds. When the network is, is lower, when it's 10 gigabits per second, we know that our performance is limited by the network because the um, uh, our storage system is faster than that. So if we imagine this situation that you see in this slide, where you have some compute nodes uh, and some parallel file system uh, servers, and they are connected through the same network. And we have a link that goes to each machine, right? So if we are limited by the network and we use we are using two of these servers and a single compute node, then the link that's limiting us is that link that goes to that single compute node. So what we expected in this experiment before running it is in the situation where performance is limited by the network, we'll need at least two compute nodes to reach, to reach the best performance. Because then when we have two, we are using in parallel two links and we are using two links to the parallel file system server. So that will give us, uh, that will give us the performance we can, we can have since we are limited by this network. So now I'll show you the results. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I'm presenting you two graphs on the left, we have uh, this scenario with this lower network. So here, the network is what's limiting performance. The network is lower than this, the parallel file system, than the storage components of the parallel file system. And on the right, scenario two, is that storage is slower than the network, meaning that the network is faster. So now we are limited by the storage components. Uh, on the x-axis of each of these two, we have the number of compute nodes. And notice that the, the axes are not the same for the two figures. On the y-axis, we have bandwidth. So the higher, the better. This is client-side client measured uh, throughput. So amount of data divided by the time to, to write the data. And we have and noticed again that the y-axis is not the same. Because when we are able to, when we use this, the faster network and we are limited by the storage components, we reach higher performance than we were re reaching when we were limited by this low network. Uh, also notice the y-axis do not start at zero. Uh, we were really trying to focus on the impact. Uh, so the fact that these two figures are side by side is just so we can uh, compare the tendency, the, the shape of the curve. Uh, between them. So what we see here is that we have, um, so we were expecting on the case where the we are limited by the network performance, which is the left, that, our perf that uh, we would need two compute nodes to reach peak. And uh, it's more or less true, meaning that we need two, uh, with two, we are much better than with a single one. But when we go from two to four, we still see some uh, small improvement uh, in performance, and it's we need four compute nodes to reach peak. When we look at the right, uh, here we don't have that network limitation. A single network link at 100 gigabits per second is fast enough, it's fa already faster than the storage components. So we should not, if we are using a single compute node, we should not, network should not be a problem. We should not be limited by the network. But still, as we increase the number of compute nodes, we see improvement. And why is that? 
uh, we uh, we believe uh, I strongly believe that this is because of uh, of parallelism because when you access a hard disk or an SSD even in a single compute node you can do the test in your own machine uh, if you in, if you put more threads more processes to access uh, that same to access a certain amount of data in parallel from that uh, from that from that uh, storage device, you usually see performance that will improve uh, until some point and then uh, stabilize or start to degrade. So what we have is that we need a certain level of parallel parallel access of uh, concurrent clients accessing data from the parallel file system in order to reach its peak. And when we have, in this case, when we have more nodes, we have more processes because we fixed the number of processes per node. And therefore, we have more uh, more uh, requests being sent to the parallel file system at any given time. So it's used, uh, it's, it's more used, it has more uh, access. Okay, so this is, this is our explanation to this. And uh, the first, uh, but then before I, I, I present you the, our first conclusions. So, okay, I just told you we need parallelism. And uh, we in this case, we have more parallelism by increasing the number of compute nodes. So then we wonder, can we use less compute nodes but increase the number of processes? So for instance, before I had eight, uh, I had eight processes per node, and this is the blue line that you are seeing in these plots. This is the same plots as before, but we added a red line. And, uh, but instead of eight, we put 16 processes per node. So we double the number of processes. So if we have half the number of nodes, we should uh, have, we would have the same number of processes. So we were, what we were wondering is, can we uh, increase the number of processes, but decrease the number of nodes and still reach the peak? Because if the if the the thing is parallelism, uh, we we just increase parallelism with the number of processes, not with the number of nodes. So we try this, and if that would if that were true, what we would see is that, for instance, here here we here, this point here is eight uh, eight compute nodes. So with eight processes per node and eight compute nodes, we should have the same. Uh, performance as four compute nodes and 16 processes per node. And that's not the case at all. In fact, when we compare the blue and the red line, they are very similar. There is some point here where they have some, some difference, but they are mostly uh, similar. So what we conclude from this is that it doesn't, uh, it's not enough to have the parallelism. In the case of PGFS, what we assume is that we also require uh, a certain number of BGFS clients that run on the compute nodes in order to, to have that parallelism to reach peak performance. So that takes me to the lessons we learned so far. Uh, first of all, the number of compute nodes is important uh, to performance. And if we want to reach peak performance, we need to use a certain number of compute nodes. So if we want to, uh, uh, to study the impact of something on performance, we absolutely need to use the, say, the uh, uh, an adequate number of compute nodes to reach the, the peak. And uh, this is why uh, we believe that related work, that paper I told you that where people used, uh, people said that the impact of the number of compute nodes had little impact on performance. Uh, we believe that was the case because in their experiments, they tried using a single compute node. If we are using a single compute node, we have a performance that's lower because we are using a single compute node. So we don't necessarily see the impact of what we are trying to analyze. So uh, if we are do doing any evaluation of performance in a parallel file system, we should first select the number of compute nodes and the number of processes which have uh, may have different impacts. And in our local machine, the vendor had had selected the the, the number of star, the, the full number of of targets the default stripe count by running experiments on a single compute node, and our default was actually bad. 
uh, which is uh, our next conclusion. So here, what we have is, is the impact of the number of storage targets. So the x-axis is now the number of storage targets. So again, the stripe count, the number of targets we are using on the system. Uh, in our system, it goes up to eight. And if we look, uh, this figure has, uh, again, on the right, we have the situation where storage is faster or where is lower. We have the faster network. When we have the faster network, we see a performance that uh, increases with the, the number of the stripe count, with the number of targets. So uh, when it goes from one to eight, we multiply roughly the performance by four. The more, the better in this case. On the left, we have some very interesting uh, results. If you look at uh, at this on the again on the y-axis we have bandwidth, so the more the better. Uh, for the same number of targets, we have groups of results. This the, here in this graph for each number of targets we have a hundred. I'm sorry, we have we have a hundred uh, points. Uh, for here. So these, are, these 100 points, they separate into two groups. And that's the same for, for some of the different number of targets. And our default was four, which is here, which is by coincidence the same as that paper uh, proposed. And it was, not, uh, it was not the peak. And four is actually not the peak in either, uh, no matter the network, we should not use four. So it's not the best solution. But we were uh, the, what we were wondering here is what's happening? Why do we have these groups, right? So the first, uh, so in order to answer that, uh, we replotted the same results. Of course, we tried multiple things. We thought about the problem for weeks. But uh, uh, of course, I will only tell you what worked, right? So our, the, the success part is we decided to plot the same data uh, with a different notation. So we used a notation that uh, says how many targets are used per server. So again, I have two uh, servers, server one and server two, so two OSS, and each one has four targets. If I access four targets, I could have uh, for instance, four in one in one of the servers and none on the other server. I could have like in this figure here on the left, where I'm using one target from server one and three targets for server two. So we write this as a one three allocation. We take the minimum and the maximum of the number of targets per um, per server. So one tree means I have one in one ser one target in one server and three targets in the other. Uh, on the right, we have an example of a zero two allocation. A zero two allocation means I have zero in one of the servers and two in the other. So we take those same results I showed you, those same um, bandwidth as a function of the number of storage targets. And we plotted that as a function of the um, of the allocation. So here on the x-axis, we have the different allocations that we observed for these uh, for these experiments. And on the on the left, the more to the left, the less balanced the the allocation is. So for instance, uh, on the far left, we have the cases where all the targets are in the same server. So there are zero in one and all the targets in the other. On the far right, we have the cases where we have a balanced uh, allocation, the same number of tar uh, targets per server. And what we see, we have two, two interesting conclusions uh, to take from this graph. The first one is as we increase, uh, as, the, as the allocation gets more balanced, we improve performance. So performance is impacted. In this case, and this is the case again. This is the case with the where we are limited by the network. So this is uh, that case here uh, on the left where we have those groups of points, and those groups of points they actually happen because of these allocations. We we found out that the points that were in the same group they all corresponded to the same allocation, and uh, the more balanced the allocation, the better the performance. And uh, 
interesting if we take situations where we have the same level of balance. For instance, on the far right, uh, we have um, four and four, one and one, three and three, meaning the same number of targets per server. The number of uh, the number of storage targets, the total number we are using, so eight, two, and six, uh, does not have any uh, an important impact on performance in this case. Because in this case, we are limited by the network. But then again, if we are trying to analyze the impact of the storage targets on performance, uh, we, we need to go to a situation where we are limited by that, not by the, the network. So in this case, if the, the if the performance is limited by the network, we don't really have an impact coming from the number of storage targets, but we do have an impact from how balanced the, this, uh, this allocation is. And in this case, if we take eight storage targets, if we use eight storage targets, that's only one possible allocation, which is four, four. And in that case, we have peak performance. We have the best possible performance. So in this case, using eight, using our maximum number of storage targets is, is the best because we, we don't depend on the, on, the speci on the allocation. So either we have a way of guaranteeing we always have a balanced allocation, or more easily, we just use the top, the, our best, our largest stripe count, and we are good uh, in the number of... Um, in, the, in our peak performance. Uh, an important conclusion to take as a side note from this is that uh, we should always look at our data carefully uh, before, like we've, we've run a lot of experiments, we generated uh, some plots and we have these points. And if we had taken only the average uh, of these points and plotted that instead of plotting all the points, we would not have found these different uh, groups of points that, of course, are not outliers or something. It's there was something happening there. It's it's it was an important information. So we should always be careful uh, when when summarizing data. Thanks, Yali. Oh, we got two uh, minutes. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll I'll be quick. Sorry. And then from the on the and when we go back. When we go to scenario two was when the network is fast. Uh, what we found is that uh, the balance, uh, having an allocation that's more balanced is also better, but the impact is less, uh, is less it's, we have less impact from, the, from how balanced the allocation is. And the number of uh, targets have a strong impact. So in this case too, the more targets, the better. We reach the best performance when we use all the available targets. So then we are concluding, okay, we should always use all the storage targets. But then if we have multiple applications that are running at the same time, uh, they will share targets if they use all of them, right? So wouldn't that be bad? So we did, uh, and I will not go into details, but we did a bunch of experiments to try to answer, is there any situation where we should not use all of the targets? We should separate them and give some to one application and some to the other, because make, having them sharing them is worse than having them not uh, having all the, 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 the storage targets, and we couldn't. We did not find such a situation. It's it was always best to use all of the storage targets. So our stripe count. So our answer was our question at the beginning was how many storage targets should we use? What should the stripe count be? And our answer is all of them. But of course, there are many observations to be made here. Uh, we, I'm not claiming there is no interference when applications share the parallel of a system. Not at all. <laughs> Please don't don't take that from what I'm saying. Uh, it, it, there, it, there is interference, but uh, we are arguing that it does not come from sharing the storage targets. It comes from other things. And also, we could only test, because of the size of our system, we could only test with up to four applications. So we expect that if we go beyond four, we would reach 
a point where we would have a performance degradation because they are sharing all the targets. However, then we should wonder, uh, are the uh, these applications, uh, are these machines, are these machines parallel of our systems usually being accessed by that many applications at the same time for large accesses? Uh, usually in most HPC machines, we don't have, uh, applications that are not that IO intensive and they are not doing IO all the time and for large volumes of IO. So the probability of having many applications uh, uh, accessing the system at the same time is not that high. And we think that uh, instead of trying to avoid interference in that unlikely situation, we should be sure that applications, they, are, they reach peak performance if they are by themselves. But of course, this is a medium size or a small size, depending on what you think about it. Uh, system, maybe it doesn't, uh, it probably does not apply to a huge system. So if you have hundreds of thousands of storage targets, um, probably don't use all of them. <laughs> but our study was more to a, to a smaller uh, system. And we actually would like in the future to expand this study for, uh, for a larger system. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I can answer your questions now. All right, let's thank our speaker. All right, so questions. Hi, that was an excellent talk. This is um, Scott Klosky from Oak Ridge. And I mean, we've published from my group, maybe a dozen papers on interference and some of your results contradict everything we found at scale. In particular, what I'm wondering is, so did you try where you had one application doing intensive random reading from just one storage target, then have an application where it reads from all of them and then seeing if it has any impact when that reading is constantly just one. Because what we find is that kills luster. So I'm just curious on BGFS what that would do. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for this question. Actually, uh, we didn't try, we only tried, uh, we didn't try interactions of different access patterns. We only tried uh, applications that were the same, same size, and uh, exactly the same access pattern, which was that access pattern that we tailored to reach peak. And why we did that was because we were interested in what happens uh, on really just the number of targets. Uh, when the applications have different access patterns, they, uh, uh, they will interfere differently. So even given different number of processes for different applications will mean that they will not just share the performance uh, nicely. But we didn't, uh, uh, at some extent, as a future work, we want to uh, evaluate the interaction of, uh, of access patterns. But at the same time, our conclusion is that uh, the interference, it's not, uh, the interference may come from the interaction of the access patterns on the storage uh, targets. But the problem is not necessarily this, the, the storage targets. It's because they are existing at the same uh, targets. It's a, a, I think I've, I was not clear enough. But what I mean is uh, we didn't. We didn't evaluate that. And that's something that we would like as uh, future work. But I would not. Uh, our conclusions, they actually go very in sync with many, uh, with a lot of the literature on Luster. Except that in Luster, uh, there are lots of work that that find that uh, sharing targets is bad because we have many disk six that come from that, and uh, we believe that the disk six are something that are kind of decreasing in importance. Uh, maybe in, in I don't know, maybe in a decade we will not talk about disk six anymore. Uh, so. Other than that, our, our results are very in sync with literature on Luster. So we believe BGFS and Luster are really very compatible. They are very similar. And uh, if we observe that for Luster, uh, we would probably observe something similar for BGFS. All right, thank you. We have a second question here. Two questions, if I may. Um, firstly, what IO sizes did you actually use for the benchmark? And secondly, you mentioned uh, 100 iterations of each benchmark. 
did you actually recreate and format the file system each time or what did you do? Because normally with Lustre, 100 iterations will have variable performance. Uh, so we, uh, we did, let me try to remember all the details. Uh, I have more details in the paper. So if you really want to find the details, I, I recommend. But uh, we use 32 gigabytes as the, as the total size of the file. So we run IOR for a shared file and the block size is the this, this size 32 gigabytes divided by the number of processes. So in total, the processes access this amount of data. And that's the case for all the tests. And we, we decided on this 32 gigabytes uh, by doing another experience I didn't show you that where we changed the number of, we increased the size of the file until we reach uh, that peak. And we selected a size that was uh, well within that, that peak performance. So uh, this is the size of the file. The, number, the requests are one megabyte requests. And we also did another experiment that I didn't show where we, we in order to select that request size that's large enough, uh, we, did it, uh, we didn't We did use, uh, when you, you asked about iterations, um, iterations, I'm guessing you are thinking about IOR iterations where you can we can pass minus I and, uh, give, and ask it to repeat multiple times. We didn't do that. What we did was uh, we, we, when I say we repeated a hundred times is we really launched a hundred jobs to do IOR, of course, one at a time, so they don't interfere with each other, but we actually generated a list of all the tests that we needed to run. So multiple tests with different number of targets with different parameters of different tests. And from this list, we take tests in a random order. Uh, and we did that because we didn't want to, uh, to, to fall in a situation where uh, something happens in the system and things get slower. And because of that, all our results with a certain parameter would be slower than with the others. So we make it random and we run one at a time, of course, and we put some time some random time and that, I'm not sure I don't remember exactly how many I'm sorry how much I'm sorry we would have we would have to check the paper but it's like uh, between a few seconds and a few I think it's a between two minutes and ten minutes or something like this we have a random time between consecutive tests and we do that first to spread the tests in time so we have tests during the night, during the day at different times and again because it's a random order all of the tests are uh, spread. And also because we observe that if you run one after the other, sometimes they are not independent. Sometimes uh, the system kind of warms up for, for the next one. Or you could or you could have some caching effect. So we put some time between them. But what we did not do, we did not format the file system because this is a system that's being used by other people. Uh, and we don't have, we are not authorized to do that. So we we didn't we didn't format the file system. All righty. Thank you. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.